Welcome here in RE Asia's Academy Creative Space Hong Kong. My name is Thomas Binzat. I am Senior Project Engineer and Lighting Designer in RE's System Solution Department. The topic we're going to talk about today is pixel mapping as a technique of kinetic and dynamic lighting. I will demonstrate how to use RE lights in a specific pixel mapping environment, how to adjust them, how to connect them and how to control them. You can see around me uh, our little shooting set, which I will introduce you more in detail a bit later. So let me start my presentation. I will be back in a second. So here I am, back at screen and ready to go. What can you expect from this presentation? I will talk a bit about the term pixel mapping, about application and purposes, I will introduce you the setup I use here, I will discuss the video content and different background solutions. Then I will show you how to connect RE lights and we'll talk about the light specifications and features and finally about MapMapper. I would like to point out one fact very clear. Everything I will explain here about MapMapper is mostly related to our RE lights. And whatever I know about MapMapper, I only got it from learning by doing. I never joined a schooling and I'm not a real MadMapper operator, I'm just the RE guy. We should clear up two terms because both of them are mixed up quite often, pixel mapping and video mapping. In video mapping you cover, align or wrap video content onto objects using beam projection. The shape and orientation of these objects is often irregular. The projector's picture output can be controlled in real time in order to fit the unique shape of the surfaces. Quite a contrast to pixel mapping. In pixel mapping we associate any kind of media content or signals like sound, images, patterns, effects, video or live camera onto an array, grid or cluster of pixels in the real world represented by lighting fixtures. These fixtures can be single channel controlled like a tungsten dimmer combination or single color LED. They can be bicolor, RGB, RGB white or any other multi-channel LED even old system like fluorescence. But whatever we do, our target will be a low resolution, self-luminous structure in relation to the high density data of our media content. The fact that we can use video content does not turn pixel mapping into video mapping. These are still two different procedures. The majority of mapping software is able to handle both techniques and this might be a reason why these terms are often confused. You may ask, what do we need pixel mapping for? I'd like to divide the use of this technology into two fields. First, pixel mapping can be used for lighting decoration, for example, stage backdrops, architecture facades, lighting fixture grids, moving light arrangement and so on. In all these installations, the look of a lighting fixture or the lighting beams are our focus of interest. By the way, our sky panel is a perfect tool for that because of its clear case design and smart front look. You can see a perfect example of pixel mapping in our well-known video clip called Share the Passion, available online. Go for it and have a look. The second field of application, this technology can be very helpful to control the lighting in movie making production. We can create a realistic lighting look, especially in virtual scenes, something you normally can only achieve in real shoots or in post-production. With pixel mapping controlled lighting you can reduce production times and production costs significantly and in addition you get an amazing tool to extend your creativity. Now I will give you an overview about the components we use here in our little shooting set, how everything is set up and how the elements working together. How can a basic shooting setup look like? First thing you need is a background, however in what technology and in front of that you have the action, like a car, or a bike, or actors. What you want is that the background scenery has a real-time impact on the objects you want to shoot. We have a very simple setup here, the action in front of the screen and the camera is taking both. As you can imagine, Corona makes it very difficult to hire a talent, so we have to make it very simple. We use for our lighting a collection of Ares L-Series, Skypanel and Orbiter. I use one laptop to feed the projector and one laptop to control the lights, which are connected via Ethernet. We'll talk about other solutions later on. 
Just a note regarding the video content. In our setup, the player system for the high resolution background video does not provide the content for the mapping software. Or other way around, MatMapper does not provide the content for the video projector. The problem is that MatMapper don't support a clear video output without visible control elements. As far I know. If someone has an idea, please let me know. You have to ensure starting the related videos on both systems in the same time and making sure that they are running synchronic. Regarding the video content, it might be easier to handle downsized video files for lighting control because high resolution videos are not necessary for pixel mapping. I suggest to render out a low resolution version of the background video. On the other hand, I'm pretty sure that there are solutions in the market in which you can run both background and pixel mapping lighting control just for one platform by hardware, software or dedicated media server. It exists a few technical systems which are able to provide a proper background image for our shooting. Let's talk about the pro and cons of the different background fittings. First, front projection. We only use it here because it's a fixed installation, but honestly it's not the best choice because the projection beam can create a shadow on the screen caused by the talent in case you need to come close to the background. So you're not really free to find the best position for camera and talent. The next challenge, the shooting space needs to be darkened as much as possible because front projection has always a problem with black. You will get spill light from your lighting set in any case and even from your projection. This will reduce the image contrast and quality significantly because front projection need to use really wide screen. Completely different to rear projection. Here we use a gray or black screen foil which will reduce the spill light problem. There are no shadow issues because the projector is located behind the screen. But you need, depending from the local length of the projection lens, the space behind the screen which you might not always have. As darker the foil material is better the contrast, but in the same time the aperture of a projector lens will be visible and will produce a hot spot in your background picture. Another very common method is chroma keying, most people call it green screen. You will face problems with green spill light, which can cause keying problems. You are limited in the lighting itself because of the specific needs regarding brightness and contrast. Important for the action, you may need a separate hardware solution showing the actor in what environment they are located and to enable them to interact with the image content simultaneously. The good thing is you can edit the background in post-production as often you want. In order to eliminate synchronization errors, playing with the blur to create an artificial depth of field or even change, changing the run of the story. There are no issues with the resolution of the background and there are almost no limitations regarding the size of the background. Another option is a LED wall. I'm not a camera guy, but, but I could imagine that in case you want to use the LED wall as a lighting source for the talent, the brightness you may need to get a proper result and sparkling effect could be too bright for the lens camera setting. This technology has its limitations and resolution, especially in short distance, and in the gear dimension, not technically, but by budget. Monitors with high resolution like 4K, 8K or even 16K have an immense contrast range based on the new technology like HDR. You might get some trouble with reflections or, or from the monitor screen surface depending on its coating. The biggest limitation is the size or the money you might have or even not. I will not pass that topic without to mention that there are very interesting technologies upcoming which can eliminate the size limitations of high resolution backgrounds. So stay tuned with inventions like TrueView, Unreal Engine, HTC Vive and other digital VR technologies. Here just a new exciting example of the new technology development in our media industry. Ari System Group along with our industry partners install London's only full-time virtual production test stage at the request of Epic Games London Innovation Lab. Ari was tasked with designing and installing a highly integrated lighting production system to provide the community an environment in which they can explore the creative possibilities. 
At this stage, I cannot avoid using a lot of technical terms like DMX, Ethernet, IP, ARDNET, Lumen Radio, etc. To dig deeper into these terms today would take much too long. Instead of that, I recommend joining the online lighting system control class run by our RA Academy and presented by Mr. Richard Gardina. I will show you now just a few examples of technologies you could use to connect RE lights. I will run through the next pictures showing the different connection types without any further comments because most of them are self-explaining. Don't hesitate to contact me in case you need more information about that. I prefer generally a pure Ethernet ARTNET environment because this technology provides a full duplex communication, means sending and receiving data in the same time. I can approach the lighting fixtures by IP and can arrange all needed adjustments remotely. For larger lighting setups, an IP network is highly recommended anyway. Now I will talk about the RE lights, how they work and how to tune them. By side the countless implemented features and functions, there are a few operation modes which turns the RE lights into perfect tools for pixel mapping. One of that operation mode is the low end mode. It provides a smooth dimming curve, especially in the very low intensity range close to zero. This mode is exclusive for sky panel because Orbiter has this function already implemented as standard behavior. Next operation mode is the RGBW calibrated color space, which I call shorter calibrated color. This mode ensures that all lights are located at the exact same white point in the RGB color space. This will help matching the light quality as accurate as possible to the video content. As an additional benefit, this mode gives sky panels a very uniform appearance if they are used especially in a front view. You will see that in our mentioned passion video. Calibrated color does not change the DMX channel configuration of sky panel, but has an influence on the channel management of Orbiter. We will see later what that means. These operation modes are needed for a basic functional setup. Uh, another sort of modes, the DMX modes, define how the DMX channels are managed. Let's start with our first LED generation, the L-series. Here an overview about the available DIMX modes. This sheet shows us the basic control method white CCT and RGB white, which we use in light engine mode and for pixel mapping. As next, the orbiter. Orbiter contains the same as L-series, only one single light engine. This light engine calls Spectra and contains six colors. RGB means red, green, blue, and ACL means amber, cyan, and lime. Here an overview about the available DIMX modes of Orbiter. Each mode we find as 8-bit and 16-bit. This sheet shows us mode 6, for which we need 26 channels for basic control of the colors. But there are much more channels available in the standard setup. There are channels for fan control, favorite, light strobe, and one is reserved. So we need additional 8 channels in 16-bit. And surprise, surprise, another 16 channels for extended color control are needed. So in summary, we need 46 channels to control Orbiter. To avoid this extensive use of DMX channels, we use a feature from Orbiter DMX setting called Reduced Channels. Set this on and the channels not used for pixel mapping will eliminate it from the active list. Finally, we have a better solution for pixel mapping with mode 9. In calibration mode, we run mode 9 with RGB and white means we control only the white. The ACL channels are not in use. Let's have a look at the sky panel. Here an overview about the available DIMX modes. But let's jump immediately to the most interesting thing, the light engine mode. The light source of the sky panel is a cluster of more than 2000 RGBW LEDs. One unit of that calls light engine and it's a plate with 30 by 30 centimeters. 
Our smallest sky panel S30 contains one light engine, the S60 contains two, the 120 contains four, and the S360 has 12 light engines. Each light engine gets its own unique DIMX start address and can be controlled separately like an independent lighting fixture. You see here that the S360 needs 193 DIMX addresses. Please keep that number in mind because we need that later in MadMapper. We see here the channel list for every first light engine of the S30, 60, 120, 360. Have a look at the last channel number 17 here used for the fan control. Here the channel list for the second light engine of S60, 120, 360. And you see the channel 17 again here as the first channel of the second light engine. How can it happen that the X addresses been used twice? The answer is, of course it will not. The fan control is not always the last channel of a light engine, but the last channel of the lighting fixture. So you will find the fan control only one time for each sky panel unit. This will cause issues in MadMapper as we will see later on. Just a very short explanation about the signal resolution. For each lighting fixture function we need at least one DIMX channel. A DIMX channel is specified with a signal resolution of 8-bit. 8-bit provides 255 values. Moving your DIMX feather up and down, you can only gain 255 different lighting steps. You will easily understand this is not enough for a smooth, stepless fade as you would see in video scenes. So how to solve that problem? The solution is combining two DIMX channels for one function which results in a 16-bit signal with more than 65,000 values. Of course, this will double the number of DIMX channels we have to reserve for our lighting fixtures. Now, finally, we are coming to our main topic, MadMapper. MadMapper is developed by a company with name GarageCube. I have to make clear, we do not promote or sell MadMapper, and this is not an ARRI solution. I am not able to claim that MadMapper would be the best choice for pixel mapping because I simply don't know how the other products are working. On the other hand, I found a lot of nice features in MadMapper which are very helpful for special needs in movie production. That might be a coincidence because if you search on internet you will find a lot about video mapping but useful information about pixel mapping is very rare. So hey GarageCube, let's work together to improve the tools. I use MedMapper just as an example to discuss procedures, workflows or problems you may also be faced with other software or hardware solutions. For your information, I use the new MedMapper in version 4.01. You can download a demo version of MedMapper which works with all features, but you cannot import fixture definitions or save a project. Before we can do anything in our set, we have to arrange a lot of setups and adjustments. We have to connect MadMapper with our lighting fixtures. We have to define how to control them. We have to set the DIMX values to find the best position for the lights. We need to administrate our media content and finally to save everything in presets. Let's start with the way how MadMapper communicate with the lights. If you open the preferences from the MadMapper menu, you will see that window provided you choose the DMX output. Make sure you use the Ethernet protocol. You see here the IP address of the connected Ethernet adapter. Just click these boxes and here below you will find all connected lighting fixtures with their IP addresses, normally detected automatically but sometimes you have to set them manually. Check if all related lights are in the same universe just remind you that the first universe in Artnet calls zero. The next step is the integration of the different lighting types. Each type with its specific DIMX channel management needs a separate adjustment which are fixed in a fixture definition. For that procedure there is a feature called fixture editor. If you open that you will see there are already basic lighting types implemented but none of them suits for us and there is not any lighting, ARRI lighting available yet. So we have to create them by our own. I will not forget to mention that you can import and export lighting fixture definitions and of course 
I have already created the definitions for our RE lights. But for a better understanding of pixel mapping, we compile the definitions here step by step. Let's start with RE sky panel. You see, I don't mention a specific type of sky panel because at first I will create only a base for all types. After that, just with a simple adjustment, we will generate the definitions for S30, 60, 120, 360. As a template, I use the channel management of the light engine mode. First, I add a new group and name it RE Training. Then I add a new fixture and name it Test Sky Panel. Now the settings. I change the pixel type to custom and the pixel size according to the amount of the MX channels the lighting fixture request. In the light engine mode, we need for one light engine 16 channels, so I enter 16. And all channels will pop up at uh, 8 bit. We have to switch them to 16 bit. The number of channels is getting reduced. Don't be confused about the channel numbers. Only the first uh, of the double channels are visible. Now we name all dim X channels according to their function. Dimmer, CCT, color temperature, green magenta, GM, and fader from the white section to the color section. As next, we set their function. That all non-color faders, uh, the first four, we set as sliders. These faders will be only visible on the DIMX value section in our working space. We set the color channels according to their color, RGBW. So that fixture definition fits for the S30 and it's our base for all other sky panel types. How to get the other sky panel types? In fact, it's very simple, because we are using the light engine mode in which each light engine follows the same channel setup. There are only two parameters to change to get the new type, the width and the height. For the S30 with only one light engine, there was already the default one by one. You will see on the right side of the application window a big black field with a start address in the middle, but the figure is so small that it's hard to discover it. Please Garage Cube improve that. A sky panel S60 contains two light engines and we enter one by two or two by one, it doesn't matter. See here the corresponding arrangement and the related start addresses. The S120 has four light engines and we set one by four. Voila! And finally the S360 with 12 light engines we set 3 by 4. So that's all for so far for the sky panels. But see another thing. Just a reminder the S30 needs in mode 6 in summary 20 DIMX channels instead of 16 in light engine mode. Because of the additional channels for fan control, preset, strobes and reserved. We would not need that function for lighting control and we can set them as unused. To be correct, we will not use mode 6 anyway. I just mentioned that to show you the unused function. And uh, because this mode 6 from Sky Panel looks the same as mode 6 from L series except uh, the not needed additional channels. Now let's talk about the orbiter. This will be easier and a bit more complicated. The easy part is orbiter has only one light engine like the L series as I already explained. The complicated part is this light engine contains six color channels, the common red, green, blue and the additional amber, cyan and lime. Another difficulty is that orbiter provides a calibrated mode and a non-calibrated mode. But MatMapper don't provide the color amber. I just, it just provides white, which is not the same. This makes that Ari's not calibrated amber is the same as calibrated white. So there is no differentiation. The good thing is there is a solution. If we use Orbiter's calibrated mode, we only approach Ari's white, which is the same as MatMapper white. ACL are not in use. So you see here that amber, cyan and lime are set as unused and we use the white from the common RGBW. We could reduce the number of needed DMX channels with the setting uh, mode 9 and only using the color RGB ACL. 
but this would not allow us to adjust the color temperature and green magenta point because that function is not available in non-calibration mode. I will not confuse you too much, but they are, we are not finished yet. There are amazing features on Orbiter. In mode 9, calibrated, we are also able to control the color temperature and green magenta point because they are separate MX channels for that. So what will be our final setting? These are all the lighting fixture definitions I already created. And these are the fixture definitions we better use for pixel mapping. For sky panel mode 25 calibrated, for L series mode 6 calibrated and for orbiter mode 9 calibrated. Everything in 16 bit. Until here we don't have any lighting in our working space yet. Our project is still empty. We add our first fixture. We see as fixture definition the generic RGB by default with only three DIMX channels. We name the fixture as S360 and need to choose the right fixture definition from the library. Now we see all needed DIMX channels up here. For the S360, 192 channels. We add the other S60 sky panels from our little shooting set. We add the L-series L7 and finally the orbiter. We see that the following DIMX start addresses are defined automatically. The S360 occupies up to address 192 and the following S60 starts with 193. But there's something wrong. We still have in mind that the S360 needs uh, 193 channels. So what's going on? We remember as well that we defined for one light engine 16 channels. As I introduced you the sky panels light engine mode, I told you that every sky panel has an additional DIMX channel as fan control, but we did not design a channel for that. The point is we cannot do that. If we would do add a channel for fan control, it would have an effect for all light engines and the S360 would have 12 different fan controls. This would mess up our entire channel management. We just need one fan control for each sky panel, but this is not possible in Matmapper's fixture definition as far I know. So what to do? I recommend generally to generate an Excel calculation sheet as you see here in order to define all DMX start addresses. I add here the missing channel and I get the right start addresses line up. But furthermore, I insert something like I call a gap. It means I add a few more empty channels as much I get a rounded DMX start address. As you see listed here. So I enter all new DMX start addresses in my setting corresponding to my calculation. This avoids any trouble with overlapping DMX ranges and it's, it's easier to keep the start addresses in mind. Next topic, the lighting fixture reference. All lights have their reference at the working space. You see here all fixtures are marked together. This makes a blue line enclosing them all. On the catching points you can move, rotate and scale, but only all together if they are marked that way. You cannot change the DMX parameters if all marked together. You have to mark them separately, here the S360. The S60 number 1, 2, 3, the L7 and the orbiter. On left window size you find the information about the position. The XY coordinates, the size and rotation of the reference. As next we have to set the basic functional dim X parameters for each lighting fixture separately. As first and most important the brightness. I set it at full, aware that it would be mostly too bright for my set, but I can adapt it later. Next is the fader needed to shift the sky panel from white section CCT to the color section RGBW. What what to do with the color temperature? 
There is no indicator for the real output exactly in Kelvin. For that we have an Excel sheet to calculate the X values for the desired color temperature for sky panel and L series. For tungsten 3200 Kelvin we get a 16 bit dim X value and for daylight 5600 Kelvin we get the dim X value. Orbiter has a different color temperature range as sky panel and covers 2000 to 20000 Kelvin. Sky panel covers 2800 to 10000 Kelvin. Unfortunately we cannot use the same sheet and we don't have a sheet for orbiter yet. I calculated the values manually and you see the results here. We copy and paste the values into the parameter fields for sky panel and for orbiter. I recommend using 5600 daylight because you get the best results for the colors. On left side of the application window you see more possibly dim X adjustments which works differently from the previous settings for all lights together in case you mark them all in once. The next is an amazing new feature in MadWeber's new version 4, the color correction. You can adjust the colors of the lighting fixture output with different methods. RGB means red, green, blue, each of them can be adjusted separately. HSV means U saturation value. And finally the color wheel which is more or less the same as uh, HSV, just a different handling method. So let's see everything in action. For demonstration I use uh, just a simple white field. You see all the lights are white. I go in the RGB section, I take out the red, I take out the blue, take out the green, I add the red, I add the blue. You see the basic field stays the same in white but the light output changed. So take me I take all down, I go to HSY, I have to give them first a brightness, then I have to give them the saturation and then I change the colors. The same with the wheel, so here is the brightness and saturation and then you go around to change the colors. Above color correction we have a fader called luminosity. It works like a general fader but it cannot control the dimmer channels of the light separately as we would need. Any move of that fader has an impact on all dim X channels, even the colors, and that we, we don't want to have. So let's see that in action. The same with the luminosity, I take a white field as a base and just move the slider up and down and you see it's not just the brightness change it's even the color temperature changed so this is something we don't want to have. And the last fader I want to present is called response. The slider has an influence on the way the real lights react. Uh, the standard fader position is 33 percentage if you move the fader toward 100% you will realize a faster light reaction and this results in a higher contrast of the light output. I use this feature very extensively for my tunings. So how it works. To demonstrate the response I use a uh, yeah, bubbling video and you see I set the response here on zero. You see the lights are not really acting in the way they should and now increase the response and you will see they're much more faster and the the contrast is getting better. An interesting feature in MadMapper is the DIMX monitor. This visualizes the state of the DIMX signal. It can be helpful for troubleshooting in case there's a problem with the DIMX signal. Here you see the current state of the color black. Only the dimmer and the faders are full here from S360. The color temperature I switch off for a better overview. See here for white, all color channels are full, gray, 
red, green and blue. Just a brief look on the DMX monitor moving in action. Now let's talk about the media data we need to trigger the lights. We see on the right side of the application window what I call the media section. There, here is everything to find we can align to our lighting fixture references. We start with a category called generators. You will find it here. In the first row, you see the already implemented default. For example, the well-known test card in black and white. You find a rotating color pattern, a grid, a rolling text. You can add copies from that elements and edit them following your specific needs. Here, the test card in blue-red, the grid in another dimension and color, the rolling text with your own words. There are solid colors like black, white, red, and blue, or whatever mixed color you need. So I'll show you this in action. So let's have a look uh, on the first row of the generators. The first row are the default. Uh, the most common is the test card black and white. There are color pattern, a grid, and uh, rolling text. And uh, as I mentioned, you can insert uh, copies of that instance and change a few parameters like I did here. The test card in blue and red, the color pattern in higher speed, the grid in different colors and another dimension, and rolling text. Not to forget the solid colors in black, white, magenta, cyan, or whatever color you need. I will use the solid color generator fields to talk about the color temperature of the output signal. I prepared few white fields from generators with different color temperature like 2800, 3200, 4000, 5000, 600 and 10000 Kelvin, which represent the range of sky panel and L series. I did not choose the orbital range from 2000 to 20000 because I want to keep all lights in the same range. The color temperature is not generated by a specific image template, but by the dimx value of the lighting fixture as I already explained. The decision which color temperature you use for your output is depending from the look of the media content. For very warm backgrounds like sun and fire, I try lowered color temperatures like 2800 Kelvin to get an impressive result. I prefer daylight 5600 Kelvin for any situation in which I want the light quality as close to the source video as possible. For nature motifs, clouds, sky and water, uh, 10,000 Kelvin might be the best choice. So let's see how it works. The first card I created in a different color temperature is the lowest, uh, 2800. The next, uh, the normal tungsten one. 3200, 4000 Kelvin, 5600, and 10,000. The next category is called materials. These are pre configured varying effects. Most of them are black and white, but you can adjust a lot of parameters for shape, speed, color, or whatever in the editor section. And not to forget the additional DMX color parameter. In the material library, you can find more materials for import. The materials are helpful if you need lighting effects which don't need to be linked to real videos like fire, water, reflection or cloud passing because they are more randomized effects. So let's see. So let's see what we have in the generator field. As I told you, they are mostly by default just black and white. I will jump through a few to show you. And you can adjust parameters like color, speed, some sort of scales. And there are 
a library where you can find uh, other materials, even colored materials, and you import that to your own library. The next category called images and this section is empty by default. I just imported one example. Unfortunately, there are not that many editing options for images available. The most important category is movies. I divide this part in two different types. First type are movies with very reduced action like color fields, geometrics, simple moves, but with less realistic content. I have uh, movies with very simple uh, ge geometric effects or, or patterns, as you see here. Color fields, blinking, fading, stripes, turning colors, or whatever you could need for testing or demonstration. The second movie types are realistic video shoots. Better to show you this in action. Here I have videos with uh, realistic content uh, like fire, waves, underwater, clouds, other scenes. Passion video, cutouts, and so on. This is a media category called image folder. You can import here entire picture folders and run them as slideshow. This could be a simple alternative to movie clips. So let's see how it looks like. Yeah, here the image folder with a um, lot of photos from Windows and uh, I run this uh, as a slideshow and you can adjust some things like, like the speed. And last but not least, I want to introduce you the live input. This means any kind of camera. MadMapper detects automatically all connected cameras. You see here the two FaceTime cameras, one from my laptop and one from my external monitor. You will see the IPOCAM connection for wireless cams and any USB camera would be shown up here automatically as well. Let's talk more about the handling. Everything we have adjusted and configured needs to be saved in presets. MadMapper called that preset scenes and cues. Honestly, to talk about all features of that could fill another workshop because there are so many things to discuss. I will keep it simple. For saving a setting, you just click into the empty scene field. Any change of a setting needs to be updated into the saved scene, otherwise it would be lost if you do the wrong click. There are a few possibilities to configure the scene icon in order to get a better overview. I remind you again, you have to adjust every functional DIMMX parameter separately for each lighting fixture. But for saving a scene, you have to mark all lights. You link the media content with the lights through a click on that small triangle. In this case, I aligned all lights to the test card. Of course you can connect each light with a different content, but this makes the handling very difficult. I don't know the reason yet why we should do that in our set. As an example, you see the orbiter with the blue-red test card and the others with the default black and white. So if all lights are linked with the right content, mark them all together and save it as a scene. For a better look, I use the media thumbnail as the scene icon. Here another scene in which I change the position of the lights. 
In this case, the light would not get a signal. And here, I moved only the 360 over the active field. So only the S360 would be visible in red and blue. Don't forget, you save a scene include the light positions. Just a few comments about creating scenes. I recommend generating new scenes only by copying already existing scenes. Otherwise, you have to adjust all lighting fixture parameters and positions separately again and really from the scratch. Take the already prepared color temperature scene as a base for all my future scenes in different versions. You see, I already created a MapMapper project with a lot of media content, scenes and cues. To create a project in that dimension is really time consuming. I highly recommend to everybody who wants to work with MapMapper, create something like a master project as I did here, be very precise in all adjustments, keep all media sources file in one main folder, follow a clear naming policy for all important files, Maintain your master project and take care of it, because without that you are lost. As more available scenes you prepared, as more flexible you are on set, in training or demonstration. I generated a lot of presets like simple color fields, grids and patterns, color wheels and rotating scanners, fading and blinking fields, multicolor patterns, nature loops, randomly moving materials, short video clips, shooting movie backgrounds. In our digital production environments, it's more and more important to work with exactly defined white points and color parameters for our lighting. The tendency in production is using a limited color palette in order to avoid any color mishmash causing trouble in post-production. You can create a general color palette easily by your own with any picture editing application. By side all that more or less complicated workflow for our main purpose, the pixel mapping, there is one very interesting application for which you can use MadMapper. You can use MadMapper as a simple lighting console. Of course, I don't need a full replacement of a digital multi-universe control board, but have a look later on. With this image, you can use MadMapper even as a fader board. Here an example with a fade from blue to red and from gray to white. So let's see that in action. So I have here my, uh, my color palette and uh, what I can do is just to pick one of the lights, for example here the S360 uh, move it over the field well, just on one take one S60 another X60 here, the others move over. So let's check the fader function. We take uh, another, again, only 360, move here from one side the other, take the orbiter here or another sky panel move it from white to dark the same for the 360 in blue in white in fading. Even running program sequences are possible with a trick. I created a simple color palette very easily with PowerPoint and used the animation features in PowerPoint to produce a run through. Finally exported as MP4 file. So let's see how it works. Yeah, for that sequence, um, first I create another color palette um, and align this to my lights and now I use uh, as mentioned the animation function from uh, PowerPoint and uh, make a little movie from that.
This is a very good illustration for the general pixel mapping effect anyway. After all that very dry theoretical basics, let's come closer to real videos which we could use as background for our shooting set. I'd like to use car rides through tunnels for my demonstrations because they have a high contrast and it's easy to foresee in what position the upcoming lights appear exactly in order to place the lights over the video. I have a lot of versions with different motives, styles and directions and speeds. I will show you how this works in action. So I show you all my yeah, tunnel videos uh, I got from internet, so be careful with the copyright. As I told you, it's a, it's a very good training to find uh, good setups for the position, orientation and the brightness um, of the lights. It's very easy to calculate where the lights are, are popping up. And uh, yeah, I use that uh, if I have a full reel shoot with a, maybe uh, in a car shoot or a motorbike. It's uh, very impressive. There yeah, much more. Or here, taxi ride uh, through Hong Kong. A ride by daylight. This same in reverse, backwards. Or train window. So the challenge is, um, if you run uh, a projector, uh, like here, as a background, that you have to start both videos in the same time to be synchronous. So what I do is, for example, I put here the background, maybe just in uh, 5 seconds in advance, so 1, 2, 3, 5 seconds, I stop and I start the video count to five and hoping that I got uh, the same position. So one, two, three, four, five. Oh yeah, more or less. Okay, same again with, uh, with the lights uh, inside. Again, one, two, three, four, five. No, oh, yeah. So you see, it's not so easy. You need uh, a few hands um, to <laughs> to start the background video and uh, uh, lighting control video at the same time. All the countless tools and features we learned until here are just one purpose to get the best matching and synchronic lighting for our shooting. But the really creative and challenging job is starting now and I call that process optimizing. It has two components, virtual with the pixel mapping software and physical in the real world with the real lighting gear on shooting set. The virtual part you have to choose the right lighting types to find the best arrangement and position, size and orientation, to adjust brightness, response and color correction and so on. And finally, you have to translate everything into the real physical lighting set. I will illustrate that on a very simple example. See here a night scene with blinking windows. I used all available features for the geometric arrangement and lighting quality tuning to get the best matching result. So let's see everything together. So here my blinking window 
you see I found for each light uh, here are more or less the right position the S360, the S7, the S60s and the orbiter I can a little bit reduce the speed I think it's a very good example to uh, show how pixel mapping is working I'm pretty sure that I could continue working on that setting to make it better and better you can always do something better you've seen some interesting possibilities of MatMapper and there might be a lot more which I could not discover yet. So that was my contribution for today. Thank you for joining me and for your passion to stay until here. I hope you could take some ideas with you. I just can say even I have learned a lot in preparation for that session. In case you have further questions or if you want to exchange your experience with me, see my details at the end. Don't hesitate to contact me. Stay tuned. Cheers and bye bye.